All right, everybody, our next panel is a lineup of women who are determined to find ways for us to all live greener lives. This next panel will be moderated. It's called The Green Revolution. Our moderator is Cheryl Heller. Please welcome her to the stage. Joining Cheryl is Elmudena Fernandez. Sort of joining Cheryl. <laughs> All right, Cheryl Heller, Elmudena Fernandez, Brooke Farrell, Mary Pearl, Natalia Allen, Paulette Cole, and Van Jones. This is the Green Revolution. Enjoy. Thank you. So for those of us inside this movement, green is an oversimplification of a really complex issue. It's not one thing, it's the intersection of a whole lot of different natural systems and political systems and ethics and science and industry. And revolution is a really interesting word for something that began on September 27th in 1962 uh, with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, and that we still haven't won today. And the other interesting complexity is that the systems that we need to overthrow are the systems that we created. So we, we are revolting against our own um, political systems, our own social habits, our own assumptions and expectations. So I'm thrilled to be here with six uh, wagers of peace in this revolution and each one of them has a very different perspective they work at different levels and they have a very different lens into the arc and the progress of this movement van jones has energized the nation with his fierce passion and his intelligence he's the best-selling author of the green collar economy hi paulette <laughs> I'm so glad you're here before I did it. Um, Van served as a green jobs advisor in the Obama White House. He's currently senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, senior policy advisor at Green for All, a distinguished visiting fellow at Princeton and the Center for African American Studies, and in the program in science, technology, and environmental policy. He's going to talk to us about an exciting new initiative called Rebuild the Dream. Dr. Mary Pearl is CEO at the Garrison Institute. She's the former president of Wildlife Trust, which is now the EcoHealth Alliance. She's a conservation biologist who pioneered the study of conservation medicine. She co-founded the Center for Conservation Medicine and the Center for Environmental Research and Conservation at Columbia. And she's been a university dean and is now on the faculty of a new master's program in design for social innovation. Brooke Farrell. Uh, is an entrepreneur. I was going to say a young entrepreneur, but that goes without saying. <laughs> She's the founder of a company called Recycle Match, which is an online marketplace that's been called the eBay of recycling. So she creates new markets for companies, connecting buyers and sellers, and convincing people that their waste is actually a resource that can be put to good use. Almudina Fernandez uh, is a supermodel. Is that, is that okay to say? Uh, she became aware of environmental issues in all of her travels and uh, began by helping to build Tribal, which is a rehabilitated neighborhood in Madrid that marries Spain's deep traditions with um, ecology. She's now a spokesperson for Oceana, which is the world's largest international organization working to restore the ocean's ecosystem. And she's been collaborating with Al Gore to spread the word about environment and sustainability. Paulette Cole uh, is the co-founder, CEO, and creative director of ABC Carpet and Home in New York, where she's a visionary presence in retail and socially responsible business. ABC is an iconic New York destination that's really been a catalyst in marrying uh, home design as a form of self-expression and as a source of enlightened practice. Paulette's newest initiative is the launch of Deepak Home Base, and she's going to talk about a restaurant that she's doing. Um, 
as well that she's very excited about. And Natalia Allen uh, is a fashion designer and a surfer. She's one of the World Economic Forum's young global leaders, one of Fast Company's 100 most creative, and one of Utney Reader's 25 visionaries who are changing your world. She founded Design Futurist in 2005, and she develops textiles that integ integrate technology, uh, rain gear with no petroleum-based chemicals, and clean plastic textiles. She's now a spokesperson for sort of waking up the fashion industry to sustainable practices. So, um, from each of your perspectives, and I'd love to start with Van, because you have the Uber perspective on the country. Uh, I'd love you to talk about what you're excited about and what's working and where you think we are in this revolution. Uh, well, first of all, it's good to be here. I see a, a bunch of friends like Gita and Teresa and Cynthia in the back, so happy to see everybody. Um, in terms of Uber, I guess she just means a political perspective. You know, there's a lot of stuff we can be distru distressed about. There's a lot of numbers that people don't have in their heads that I wish they did. One number is 2.4 million. Uh, there are 2.4 million green jobs in America right now that wouldn't have been there uh, except for the leadership of the White House. Uh, that's a, a big number, and uh, it's an exciting number. Uh, the, uh, the other number is 1,000. Uh, we have uh, 1,000 percent increase in the number of poor people, low-income people whose homes are being weatherized so they can benefit from some of these new technologies over the, the previous uh, administration. There's a lot of positive stuff that's happening. The solar industry doubled in size 2009 to 2010. Despite China flooding the market with cheap solar, we're still going to grow another 26 percent in solar uh, this year. There's a lot of positive stuff that's happening. Worst economy since the Great Depression, Congress missing in action. Uh, China, you know, God bless them, trying to own the, the global green uh, markets, and yet we're still doing great. Uh, we, the, the green part of the economy grew at tw twice the rate of the, the rest of the economy, even through all these tough times. So there's a lot, I think, to celebrate and a lot to be excited about. Uh, I think that just because D.C. is kind of stuck on stupid right now and doing kind of food fight politics doesn't mean the rest of us should be sad because we've got great entrepreneurs, we've got a great leadership at state and lo local levels, and I think we should we should continue to shine the spotlight on the positive. Will you <laughs> Can you talk about Rebuild the Dream? Sure. Um, after I resigned from the White House, I spent uh, some time in Jerusalem, and then I spent a year teaching at Princeton. And I observed something that was kind of surprising. I hadn't thought about it this way. But it, I had you know, students you know, on both sides of the political perspective what I noticed is that the more conservative students the, who were interested in libertarian ideas were, had a certain amount of confidence. You know, they felt like they were a part of something. And I realized they were part of something called the, the Tea Party. And that was a great thing for them. They was something they could be a part of, they could be proud of, they could belong to it, they could feel a sense of community. But the progressive students and even the moderate students who also were concerned about the economy, they didn't have anything to join. And I thought that was kind of strange because, you know, progressives are actually pretty good at building organizations for people to join, you know, whether you're talking, if it's the environment, NRDC, Sierra Club, uh, African Americans, NAACP, um, uh, women's issues, NOW, Planned Parenthood. We're actually pretty good at creating organizations for people. And yet here we are, biggest economic catastrophe since the Great Depression, three years into it. And if you're a progressive or a moderate, what do you join if you want to do something about it? So uh, we launched this thing called RebuildTheDream.com to give people who love the country and care about economic uh, policy and care about jobs something to join if they didn't want to join the Tea Party. Got 70 organizations involved, including name brand groups like uh, Planned Parenthood, AFL-CIO, and others. Uh, we launched in June. We have 600,000 members, more than half a million members all across the country, every congressional district. And uh, it seems like we're meeting a need there. We asked people who are involved what should we do to create jobs? And not number one, but number two, green jobs. So uh, there is a, a passion out there still in the country to, to, to solve the economic problems and the ecological problems through the kind of innovation we're talking about here. Thank you. Uh, Alma Dana said something really wonderful to me as we were standing outside. And she said that she wanted to inspire people here today 
as she was inspired last year when she came here. So I would love to hear you. I'd love um, to hear you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> I mean, um, well, last year I was sitting like you sitting there today, and I was, you know, seeing all these women, and it wasn't men at that time, but, you know, all these women getting together and, and inspire other people. And I was with my friend, Visila Bococo, and we were sitting in tears because it really touches. And three weeks later, we went to Ghana to build eco-friendly and sustainable libraries for kids there. And the whole screening was so amazing and it was a life changing for me. And that was because of this symposium. So I want to say that inspiration and action and passion together, we, we all together, we can make a really good change in the planet and we can change the world. So I think these kind of talks are so important because we all share in all that and we can do something about it because it's not just talking, it's about action. And going to, to Ghana and see all these kids with their smiles and you know, and emerging all merging all like green energy and education. It was so amazing and all happened because this in person. So I'm very thankful to be here today, sitting here and talking to you and you know, sharing it with you because we all can do something and I hope I can inspire you to do something and next year you can sit up here and share it with us. So, so what would you like to inspire them to do specifically? What are you working on? Um, if, I mean, I started, for me it was, I mean, the whole thing, inspiring people and bringing the awareness, it started when I was very young because um, I was raised in a little town with my mommy was divorced and he didn't have enough money to buy toys to my brother and I. So she used to take us every day to the, um, to the forest and we play in nature and with nature. And since, since that early age, I started notice the force of mother nature and it creates a really beautiful bonding between my family. And since then, I want to honor mother nature many gifts. So, Traveling, when I, I was 18, I started traveling because uh, modeling and I saw the, uh, the need of awareness in, in the humanitarian and ecological changes. And um, I decided to use my name to, I mean, established name in the fashion business to bring that awareness to people. And somehow um, I started doing, like, like you say, this project in Madrid that we, we were a small group of visionaries and we tried to um, change the Madrid city center area, merging all the uh, eco-friendly living, sustainable with, the, with all the um, urban living. And they became very, very successful. And now other, now other cities in Madrid, they, I mean, in Spain, they're using the same example. So through there, the climate project contacted me and they asked me if I wanted to be the ambassador in Spain and spread the word. And for me, it was the most it was a dream come true. It's something I wanted to do since I was very young. And they were giving me the platform, the perfect platform to, to inspire and to talk to other people about the global warming, the consequences, and the solutions. So from there, I went to uh, Oceania. Because one of the things that really took my attention it was the global warming and the ice melting and the sea level raising, causing all the human uh, migration and all the poverty. And I started thinking, oh my God, I don't know anything about oceans. And 70% of the whole planet is water, the oceans. And 70% of our human composition body is water. So that connection, I said, I need to know more about this. So that's the way I, I get involved with Oceana. And I realized that, you know, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of species already gone. 50% of the whole ocean species are already gone because human influence. And we are mm, destroying so many marine ecosystems and alter so many marine ecosystems because of our actions. And we need to know that we are connected to the ocean and whatever we do into the oceans is gonna have the same sad effect in our lives, our health, our economy, and the climate change. So we, we need to do something about it. Whatever your passion is in, like for me, fashion is, is, is my passion. So I brought out like um, a zoo, eco-friendly zoo line. So I can, we use in sustainable materials and recyclable um, packaging and we put the seeds inside of 
each box so everybody can plant their own tree to neutralize the CO2 um, of in the emission of the process of the, the process when was emitted all the CO2 in the process that, uh, of doing the sewers. So I'm trying to say that we all, whatever we do, in where our passion is, we can do something about it. And we can share it with other people and we can inspire other people like the last year these women did to me. So it's all about talking, sharing, and getting together and make a change for me. That's Great. <laughs> Natalia, you are working in fashion in a very different way and literally creating fashion that is pioneering and sustainable. Can you talk about what you're excited about and what you're doing? Sure, there, there are a few major issues in the fashion industry that kind of go under the radar. Uh, one happens to be the resource use. And fashion is increasingly becoming fast, faster, and faster. And in that process, we're using more and more resources. So there are companies such as the one, such as the one I founded that are looking at technologies that slow fashion down and when we can't slow fashion down, we're actually closing the loop and reusing resources, which is, in my opinion, extremely important because we're all on this one planet together and we have a rising middle class, which is a great thing, but that rising middle class cannot use the amount of resources that we, a minority of the population on this planet, currently use. The other issue in fashion that kind of goes uh, unaddressed is the toxic toxicity factor. Uh, many of the clothes we wear have hundreds to thousands of known carcinogens, neurotoxins, endocrine blockers. And these, these materials, basically, we wear on our skin every day. And we're finding that um, these chemicals are, are, are increasingly found in our blood and are linked to systemic disorders. So. Uh, designers such as myself are looking at ecological ways to dye materials, to finish them, and to create interesting colors and looks without bringing cadmium into your closet. Uh, I think a another big issue in fashion that I'm personally working on is the, the labor side, right? This, this environmental movement has been very much about things and not about people. Um, and I'm really interested in helping address the exploitation of women because 70% of clothing workers are women. And these women are being exploited day in and day out, paid very little wage, wages um, for, for their expertise, right? They're artisans, they're, they're working 12 to 20 hour shifts and, and basically we know that we can do better. So um, in my company, I'm fascinated by technologies that begin to elevate the work workforce and bring them from behind the sewing machine and, and make them engineers. And, and through robotics and, and I would say seamless supply chains, we're able to kind of break up some of the, the current uh, systems that are, that are happening. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. And Mary Pearl, you are a scientist and an educator. And um, I have always loved your ability to connect everything that we do as a species with the natural systems of nature and the implications of what we do. So I'd love to know what you're excited about and what you see on the horizon. Well, I'm very excited by the inspiring people I'm, I'm sitting with. and. Uh, what uh, particularly struck a chord with me, uh, your concern, uh, Natalia, about toxicants in clothing because amazingly our policy in this nation is you can put anything out into the environment and the onus is on a beleaguered government agency to, to tell us all that it's not safe and there are no, not sufficient resources. So what has me very excited um, is uh, in two ways we are really building our knowledge that's going to have a very positive impact um, on the environment. Um, and the first is um, we talk a lot about ecosystems. Ecosystems are simply species, where they live, water, air, and the emergent properties that come from them. 
but in the presence of climate change, we are not keeping track of what is happening to species, species that are very important to us, like dung beetles. Nobody thinks about dung beetles, but they're the ones that uh, provide the service of taking what uh, cows uh, leave after they've, uh, you know, feed has been through the digestive system. <laughs> We'd be knee deep in it if the humble dung beetle didn't bury that and, and actually break it down and make it available as nutrients in the soil. We have a huge agricultural sector, um, but we're not following the pollinators. There was big news when the, hum, uh, the humble bumble um, honeybee went into a decline, but that's a small fraction. Most of our crops are pollinated by wild bees and other wild pollinators, whether they're birds or, or other insects. So can you imagine if in the news program, when it was time to turn to the weather, the weather person said, it's anyone's guess. I don't know if a hurricane's coming. I don't know if we're going to have a drought. I can't tell you it's going to rain. Well, this is where we are with uh, ecosystem services. But um, recently, the National Science Foundation has allocated $400 million. And you know how scarce money is these days. But this is so important. Um, there, they, the U.S. has been divided into 20 domains that are determined by their distinctive uh, ecological characteristics of land formation, species, weather, and so forth. And for the next 30 years, um, uh, stations in each of these domains, plus continent-wide views from overflights, there will be 30 years, 24-7 analysis of what is happening to our ecosystems. What will we be able to do? We'll be able to predict some of the uh, impact of climate change. Because we hear scary talk about climate change, but we don't know how to how to change, say, agricultural policy at the county level. So this is a very exciting opportunity. This is called the National Ecological Observatory Networks Program. And it's really, for the first time, going to put us on a, on a great uh, footing of knowledge on climate change and its impact. So we don't have to just be scared. We'll have an information we can use. And then the other, um, the other exciting notion is really not uh, one that came from scientists, but from multidisciplinary teams. There was a group um, at McKinsey and Company, and then an interdisciplinary team at the Environmental Law Institute looking at how can we, how can we reduce the uh, carbon footprint, reduce greenhouse gases, so that our emissions uh, meet the challenge that uh, President Obama put out, which was between from the 2005 level, when we get to 2020, we will have reduced our emissions by 17%. Well, the analyses were really good news. If we just uh, look in the household sector, um, if we not even if we ha change policy about demanding that appliances have uh, use less energy, if we simply use practices that we already know to work like um, uh, insulation in our walls, or using the best, the most efficient appliances, or using programmable thermostats, we can reduce uh, household energy across this nation um, by um, a, a huge factor. Um, and uh, it would amount to 44% of the <coughs> challenge of 17%. It's uh, something like 4.3%. I, I can't think in front of a large body in, that, in numbers. But uh, then uh, another, the, uh, another way of looking at it is that we all have a role to play in our household management. It's not that, it's, it's not that difficult. So I'm very excited that at the same time that we have this information, we're also learning more about decision making. We know, for example, that there's a status quo bias, that we tend not to make changes simply because our brains are not uh, geared towards doing that. There's a bandwagon effect. We know that if our neighbors change in certain ways, we will too. So um, we can use our adva more advanced understanding of decision making that sociologists and psychologists are, um, are producing the knowledge about uh, carbon footprints that scientists, uh, lawyers, and policymakers so I, I have a, a feeling as never before that we have a broad interdisciplinary approach to uh, the environment. And so I, I feel very sanguine about our chances. Thank you. Paula, you, you've created
created this physical place that's become such a symbol for your vision and your standards, and you touch so many of these worlds. What are you doing that you're most excited about? Mm -hmm. um, hi, everybody. Um, um, well, I'm excited about several things that we're doing. I, you know, I think that part of what I'm most excited about is all the people here on the, this panel and even interwoven through the day. Um, you know, we have this platform in New York City where we get to, let's say, hold hands with the end consumer person who's having the experience and, and we get to tell stories and raise awareness you know, on a daily basis. And we, we try to create a platform that through um, our passion and beauty and commerce, we feel can potentially have a positive effect in the world. And um, so uh, we do it through a lot of, you know, finding a woman who's as committed to her path as possible to curating people and vision and passion and product um, like this example um, in the store so that you know what it does is people who are uh, able to kind of vote with their dollars get involved learn take personal action be involved by you know their own personal transformation by creating through self-expression and how they invest in what's happening collectively in manufacturing by making choices in their lives and that we're able to try to inform them to make really wise choices. And ones that um, we really talk a lot about, um, home is a mirror and you know, it also begins within being at home in our own bodies. And if, if we're at home in our own body and then we, as an extension to our body, create home in our, our personal homes and then see the world, you know, as our collective home, the earth. And then when that mirror is reflecting back, like, you know, we're in trouble, that's kind of a reflection of who we are collectively. And so what we've tried to do is really offer, you know, some real, some antidotes, some options for people to make choices that kind of power this green revolution. And so we've been working really hard at that. Um, to speak to Cheryl's question directly, uh, one of the newer models that we've been able to do uh, is open a restaurant in New York City um, with John George at ABC Kitchen, which uh, took us several years to really get a restaurant that would, could align with our values and could show up locally, sustainable, and using organic food, and also have a chef that could be a mentor and model a restaurant out to other chefs and res restaurant owners across the country. And our biggest challenge was our other partner, Phil Suarez, which, with John George, um, you know, would always say to me, you know, we can't have all those values and be profitable too. And we said, you know, we're going to learn how to do this. And when we do it, we're going to shout out and amplify and really create a model. And, um, you know, we were able to do that this year. And we, uh, yay, we also, um, <laughs> You know, we won the um, James Beard for the best new restaurant in the country, and you know the buzz is really happening. But it's it's collective force. You know, it's not about it's it's how all it's created raising the bar and creating a new demand out there that the the people want they want to eat organic food. You know, it's like you align quality with the, what we want to put in our bodies, and we don't want to have pesticides offered to us. We you know we want to be you know healthy and um, you know, that whole thing. And anyway, the other, <laughs> I can go on and on, but, um, so we're also doing a programming with Deepak Chopra in the store, and we're kind of creating a multimedia salon where we can have the conversation and conversations with all kinds of people in all different walks of life that are doing their part to be part of this collective community who's trying to create a better place. So, on this Thank final. you. Yeah. Brooke, you okay? I am okay, thank you, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. So, so fashion and beauty and home and a lot of the things we've been talking about are pretty traditional within the women's purview, but you've entered a market where you're talking trash with businesses all over the world. Yep. What's that like <coughs> and how's it going? Um, well, it's really interesting. Um, it's definitely an old boys' school in the U.S. 
Um, but it's interesting when you start looking at the global economies, the Zebelin and a lot of the waste pickers in different countries really are women and children. So, you know, there are different models out there. Um, it was interesting just kind of listening to all the different subjects today. You know, Van started talking a little bit about energy and carbon. I heard you talk about water. You know, you were talking about materials use and closed loop. You were talking about ecosystems and you were talking about new business models. And I'm like, yes, all of that is part of what I'm focused on. Um, 10 years ago, I started working, consulting for waste management, a large waste company that you guys have probably heard of. And if you think of them as a good company, that's probably in part due to my work. Um, that's what I did was their marketing campaign for a decade. And during that time, I learned an obscene amount about trash. And I learned that it has a huge impact on carbon, huge, untold when you look at the life cycle impact of waste, and we're still trying to figure out what that really is, but I mean, it's significant. Um, it also has a big impact on energy and water use. I mean, waste and, and making the things that we go and put into the landfill has huge economic and environmental issues. Um, in the U.S., companies spend $20 billion a year to put stuff in landfills, and based on the leading companies' waste management here in the U.S., their estimates are that those materials are worth somewhere between 20 and 40 billion. I mean, why would you spend 20 billion to bury something that's worth 40 billion? That makes no sense. And yet, that's what we're doing here in the US. Globally, it's about six times that size. And that doesn't always necessarily capture the uh, informal markets. So what I'm trying to do, what I'm building, is a software platform. It's got an online marketplace and then other uh, software pieces that companies that are generating waste, uh, the recyclers and companies that aggregate those materials, people that have large volumes of stuff, I'm not talking about your curbside bins, can actually go online and have better access to the real markets for the materials. Go and actually get true market value for what that stuff is worth on the global market. Um, they can also get better information and they can crowdsource and share information in open source networks to really understand how to prepare materials in order to best maximize the value of them so that they're all of a sudden usable in fashion or they're usable in a different type of industry or manufacturing. And so those are the kind of things, and it's very complex systems work. It's funny, I build one thing and then I think, oh, this is gonna be it. And then it's only a tiny piece of the overall puzzle. And so then I build the next thing and I think this is gonna be it. And it's just a tiny piece of the overall puzzle. And so then it's like, okay, the next step and the next step. And so it's really a very interesting entrepreneurial venture to kind of go from one piece to the next and piece together this huge global market. Um, and yes, it is interesting that it's a male-dominated, non-traditional kind of uh, area. And how, how, is, how is the acceptance of it going? You know, um, it's going well. The initial marketplace piece of what we put out there um, has been a real value for individual plant managers at manufacturers facilities. Um, it's been a value for um, smaller businesses. Um, the enterprise software that we just launched is really tailored to large corporations. So if anybody happens to be from a large corporation with multiple manufacturing sites globally, come talk to me. Um, and that piece has really been crucial. I think the ultimate winner on this is going to be when we merge those two models together, and that's really my next step. Thank you. Yeah. Van, in your world, um, have you seen the attitude of businesses change towards what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, I mean, as I said, part of the, one of the things I, I love about the work that so many people here are doing, you know, this is the, the, the solution to a number of the problems that we were having in the U.S. economy. The, the old economy had certain features. Uh, it was based on consumption rather than production. It was uh, based on credit rather than thrift and smart savings like our grandparents. And it was based on ecological destruction rather than ecological restoration. That's, that's how, that is the economy that just crashed. Production, I mean, I mean consumption, credit, ecological destruction. The way you fix that, you start producing things, building rather than borrowing. Uh, you start relying on thrift and conservation and the, the wisdom of our grandparents. And you focus on ecological restoration rather than ecological destruction. That is the green economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the green economy isn't just for 
uh, you know, people who happen to like polar bears or trees, I mean, uh, that's good stuff. It's also for people who like to have a functioning American economy. That's really, it's, it's the answer to a whole basket of problems. And I think that the best entrepreneurs are seeing that. And when you go to the business schools now, uh, overwhelmingly, the classes that the young entrepreneurs are taking are in socially responsible business. Over they're not forced to. They just can see the future. And overwhelmingly, the female students are the ones who really seem to be getting it and to be, to be driving hard in this direction. And so you're seeing, I think, a number of things coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, if you just look at the stuff on cable television, you'll get depressed. But if you look at what's actually happening in the country, you have new kinds of entrepreneurs coming forward. Uh, they look different. They think different. They don't go with the old binaries, either you make a ton of money or you're a do-gooder. They don't want to be a broke do-gooder and they don't want to be a rich uh, planet wrecker. They actually would like to be able to do something positive both for their pocketbook and for the planet, and they're doing it. Now, my view is that if we started voting with our dollars to support those kind of ideas, but also voting in the, vo in the voting booth so that America's government could be a better partner to these problem solvers, we would be really moving in the right direction. And I think that, I think, you know, honestly, over the next 10 years, for lack of other options, <laughs> you're going to see these entrepreneurs doing really well. Um, I was at, at a thing with Gita uh, uh, with, uh, on the West Coast. All of the new uh, technology entrepreneurs, et cetera, they're, they're, it's just a given that they're going to be socially conscious. It's a given they're going to care about the, it's not, you don't have to argue about that. And so the next wave that's coming, I think, will uh, have many of the values that have been discussed here are going to be embedded in our products and our services, and then hopefully uh, in our government. We just have to find the tipping point. Yeah, and yeah. I think, and I think we're, we're getting closer. Sometimes things have to get really bad. You know, you know in your personal life, uh, you know, you can have, sometimes you have to have a real breakdown before you have a breakthrough. And I think that's what we're going through right now. It's like we're going through this period where people are really frustrated and stuck. A lot of people would like to be involved in something positive. They'd like to buy the right stuff. They're seeking it now. And uh, at some point, as those needs get met, you just you pass a tipping point, and we'll be in, in uh, this, these kind of com uh, conversations will be much more uh, normal throughout the society. Great. Thank you. Natalia, you talked about the exploitation of women. Do you think there's something that women can do? in particular to get us more quickly to the tipping point? In many countries around the world where there are more lax regulations around labor laws, the women are being, I think, abused, basically. Um, these are women whose only desire is to see their kids go to school. And in order to do that, in many places they need just a little bit of money. And that little bit of money is being offered to them if they'll work 15, 20 hours shifts, literally. Um, these are women who wander home in the dark at 2 a.m. I mean, all the things you can imagine, right? So these are the scenarios that they're living in. Um, so there, I think there are a new crop of companies that are aware of this and looking for ways to, A, localize production, um, bring things closer to home where you can control and see what's happening with, with your products and how they're being made. So being aware of where your products come from, uh, I think, is one thing that women can do to support the businesses that really care about the workers behind their products. Another thing companies are doing, and I'm particularly you know, interested in, are how, are tech, how is technology going to play um, a part in sort of revolutionizing production? So the sewing machine in the fashion world has been around for hundreds of years, right? I mean, we've been depending on this one machine and a worker to make our clothing for centuries. So what are the technologies of the future, and how are we going to make clothes in the future and in my world, you see robotics playing a part. And you then see the worker now controlling a computer instead of behind a sewing machine. Um, and I think one of the other big uh, areas that fashion. Are those green jobs, by the way? Sure, we'll put them in. <laughs> okay. Put them in. Uh, there. The other area I think that's really interesting is obviously fair trade. So for. Um, for businesses that are interested in the artisanal crafts of, of women around the world um, in, in various nations, they're basically establishing programs like Fair Trade, where, where one can be assured that even if this product was made 
in, in a, I guess you would say a third world nation, the, the worker behind this product is being paid a living wage, is being guaranteed a certain amount of safety and dignity, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are three things I think we can look out for when we're shopping and, and ensure that we're kind of like enforcing the right things, you know, basically voting with our dollars. Thank you. Amorina, do you think there's a particular role for women and something in particular we can do? I think it's, it's about women and about, it's about people. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, people getting together. I mean, I don't make separation between mm -hmm. men and women. I think we all got the potential to do something and they transmit and bring awareness. So I think we can make a difference in all they have it. You know, we, we can make a difference from our way of living, like saving electricity, recycling, uh, walking to, to our jobs, and they, all these little things that we put in it together at the end is it, a good response, and your, le uh, your way of living is going to change and inspire the people around you. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. Thank you. Mary, do you have a point of view? Um, well, I was thinking as you were talking about not making a distinction, I was thinking, well, what distinction am I making here? And it, there are thought leaders among us, and I think people who come to an event like a Lee event are thought leaders because they want to be provoked and stimulated to new ideas. And as uh, thought leaders are influencers, thought leaders are the people who will try new products, who will try the CFC bulb when everyone says, oh, don't try it, the funny, the color's funny or something. Are, and so I. I'd say that um, each one of us can think of ourselves as a thought leader for the new economy. And in every action, consider, are we moving with this decision towards more green living or away? Paulette, what about you? Um, well, I'd love that. I, you know, I think that we each take it personally into our lives, absolutely. Um, I mean, everything everyone is saying is really speaking to me. I mean, what Van pointed out is that, you know, the young women coming out of school are, seem to be the ones that are deeply um, feeling and holding that kind of maternal energy of how do we move our culture forward with consciousness um, and really kind of taking the ball and running with it. So, um, I, you know, and I just think that it's a little bit easier to be able, you know, for women to express themselves and to kind of choose things that really align with their heart and their values more than their rational minds on some level, not to make separations between men and women, but, you know, I, um, I, I do feel that there, you know, there is that kind of gift and, you know, in, in some, and the, the woman as a consumer plays a really, you know, important role and also in having, you know, the, connection of women for women in the artisan world where, you know, we, we at ABC were really deeply invested in, um, you know, indigenous culture or the design DNA of the indigenous people that, you know, that DNA has been, has been you know, filled with 5,000 years of, you know, wisdom and integrity that's kind of endangered to globalization on certain levels. So for us, you know, how, how we champion you know, the women, the artistry, the indigenous cultures is, you know, to kind of take the wisdom that we know now and go into those archives and kind of extract what can, what we can translate into a modern context and allow that to sustain. So that, you know, again, sustainability is not always directly about, you know, the, it's the trees or, you know, the environment, but it's, it's, it's humanity. I mean, it's, you know, everything that we've been offered and given, so. Thank you. Brooke? Yeah, you know, that was an interesting question. Do men or women, is there a difference there? And I think, of course, certainly we're all human and that should be the core, but it's interesting that there are so many women focused in this area. Um, and I've got a hypothesis that may or may not be right, but um, there's a, a saying, and I'm gonna forget who to attribute it to, but that the eye can only see what the mind is prepared to see. And, um, you know, that can be a real defense mechanism in a good way, you know, when we have a car accident or something horrible that happens in our lives. But if you think about it, the industrial economy that exists today, most 
of the people who are highly invested in that economy are men. And so you think about who it is that can see past the obvious, you know, can see past, you know, what is there today and look beyond that to what could be there tomorrow. It's going to more likely come from people who are not as heavily invested in the current business climate. Um, so I think there is sort of a real reason why you see more colored faces and why you see more women and why you see people from different backgrounds. Thank you. I just want, want to just kind of build on that. I mean, part of, the, part of what I think we're dealing with is that we, we try to get this green revolution going. And a big part of what was exciting about 2008 for a lot of people is that in 2008, this conversation went mainstream in a big way. Uh, 2006, Al Gore's movie came out. Uh, 2007, it was like the year of green. And by 2008, a lot of the ideas that we have actually poured into politics. You had all three of the, Demo the three major Democratic candidates saying they believed in green jobs. You even had John McCain talking about climate and, and, um, and talking about clean energy and, and that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of hope and excitement. 2009, we were able to get a bill through the House for cap and trade. Uh, there was uh, $80 billion in the stimulus package for green stuff. And then we ran into a wall. And, I, you know, it's important for us to, to kind of keep this positive, but I think we also have to, to talk about reality, which is that we are in some trouble in how we punch through the barriers that we've come up against. Uh, the old legacy uh, uh, thinking, uh, you said the status quo bias. Uh, you also mentioned the um, uh, status quo interests. Uh, they're there, and they've shown themselves to be not that interested in holding hands and singing kumbaya. So what are we going to do? One of the things I think is important is that the voices in places like this have to get, I think, louder and more insistent. Uh, there is, uh, uh, look, if you look at just the past couple of weeks, we might be in a situation where the renewable energy industry in America disappears next year because all the tax credits and that kind of stuff that are required to make some of this stuff viable, it expires at the end of this year. Congress has to act. Well, this Congress doesn't want to act, and now because of the Solyndra solar scandal, there's an excuse for them not to act. Well, so we can let that go down, or I think most of us have cousins who are in both, you know, some other political party or, or ex-boyfriends or ex-girlfriends. We know a ton of people. We know how to mobilize. We know how to raise our voices. We know how to say, listen, this is not a, this is not a partisan issue anymore. Uh, we, uh, uh, these young entrepreneurs should be able, uh, we love the market system, uh, but markets based are, are based on rules. And right now the rules are wacky and unfair and advantage the old folks and they don't give the new entrepreneurs a fair shot. And so there's an opportunity for us now, I think, uh, there's a group called greenforall.org, which I had a role in getting started. Greenforall.org is going to be taking this on, led by a woman of color, not surprisingly, to try to take on this issue. Uh, the, uh, rebuildthedream.com. We've got to be able to get involved as entrepreneurs, as consumers, as, uh, uh, as citizens, as community members, but also as actors in, in the political domain. If we can actually, this year, uh, after the BP oil spill, after all the stuff that's going on, if we can come together as a country a little bit more and put a little bit more support behind the people on this panel, I think we can get something done. I can, I can think of projects that each of you would do together now, having met each other, so that's great. Um, we have time to take a couple questions from uh, any of you. Um, and I just want to say what's remarkable about everybody up here, in addition to what they've accomplished, is that they're all people who are infinitely curious about the impact of their actions on the rest of the world. And they've made it really personal. So um, before we end, Mary is going to lead us in a little reflection for each of you in terms of what this conversation and what this revolution personally means to you. But we have time for a couple questions. Hi, I work for a retailer back in California. And I really wanted to bring up uh, environmental initiatives. The problems I'm running into right now is cost cutting. That's, you know, we're public, we used to be a public company, but that's the big challenge there. How, it, it does 
conflict. So I'm trying to put a proposal together because I, I had to choose one because I, 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 this, is, this is from scratch, water. So are there sites, I, I looked at Greenpeace, they list a bunch of chemicals they went and raided a couple of mills in China. Where I could look at in terms of audit, like how to, we, it does cost money to bring in water quality audits for each of the mills and factories we're gonna work with. So I, in, in accumulating this report, where are some of the sites that I can actually go and research and put together? I, I did look at Gap and Levi's because they are big companies, they're already taking one step ahead in, in making part of their business practices, but I think that there's not enough for a smaller company to get into this. And so I think that's gonna be a challenge because there is gonna be money involved and it's not gonna be likely, but again, that could be at, attractive to the customer. Mm -hmm. So I'm not clear on what type of business you have uh, It's a clothing company. It's a clothing, so you manufacture apparel? Uh, we work through agents, so that's another challenge too because right. we're, you know, with best costs, sometimes we're moving from Southeast Asia to, you know, African countries, so there's not really a s established partnership with factories. It, it's more or less we're always sourcing in different areas. So I know that's a challenge too because there, it's a third party amongst a third party. So basically the way the business is set up, you're de-incentivized to do this work. Yeah. Because if you were to engage in auditing your factory, you'd want to make sure that quality control yeah. that factory yeah. is, is set. So there are organizations such as Textile Exchange. Sorry, Textile, textile Exchange. Exchange. Okay. Uh, RAP is another one. And, but basically they're going to offer you the service of auditing your factory and giving you those hard facts as this is the amount of fabric you're wasting. These are the textile inputs, et cetera. Okay. These are the working conditions. Okay, because we work with Biru Veritas for testing and compliance and then right. do random audits. Right, but, but it's, you want to work with an organization yeah. that has sort of an interest in yeah. giving you okay. like the best end product, right? Not yeah. an organization that's yeah. just going to say, okay, there are no babies yeah. on the floor, you yeah. know? Um, so those are the two that come to mind okay. that I know are globally okay. utilized, but again, there is not going to be much momentum yeah. for using them if you're going to then next year move from yeah. uh, Malaysia to Pakistan, yeah. you know? Yeah, so there also has to be a higher level discussion as to, you know, creating mm -hmm. a supply chain that's stable, mm -hmm. that you're gonna invest yeah. in, that you're gonna grow yeah. with, and figuring out the, you know, the yeah. financial model behind that. That's a challenge in itself, but I think I'll start off with this um, yeah. and getting together. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Paulette, do you have any? I, I think that she said it okay. best. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I think each of you um, is doing something um, quite incredible. And it's my motto that whenever you meet something incredible, you always double it. So I've come here with a doubling action. Um, I'm an advanced... Uh, architect and philosopher, and this is my associate, um, and we have um, a house that we built in East Hampton, Long Island, which I'd like to invite each of you to visit, um, because it is a new type of think tank. It's a totally new type of architecture. It's an architecture that converses with the body for figuring out what the hell we are in the first place, because you may have noticed it, I'm sure you have, given the incredible level of your discourse, that we are puzzles to ourselves. And this is a very important part of the Green Revolution, that we learn how to sustain ourselves as organisms. All right? So this is a new type of architecture, totally new to the world. It was exhibited at the Guggenheim Museum back in 1997, and some um, examples exist around the world, but the only example on this continent so far is in East Hampton, Long Island, and you can come and play and try it. What, what, is, what does it do? You like, like, said it's new, but what's like new about it? Yes, it, uh, this is what's new about it. Uh, my partner and I have written a book titled Architectural Body, and we say the basic unit for consideration when you try to figure out how we walk and talk um, is the body proper plus the architectural surround, okay? So in view of that, we have developed a number, about 20 or so, and counting, 
There have been three international conferences on this work. It's a very well-kept secret that's kind of known, but um, there are architectural procedures that converse with you, and it converses with the code of automaticity that runs the human organism. So would you like an answer as Shall to we whether, play? whether they will show up? They'll take your, you want a yes or no? Yes, yes, invitation? I'd love an answer. Sure. 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 Great, sure. great, great. Yeah, yes. it's an open challenge. It just, it has to do with whether you have an appetite, an appetite for learning how not to die, for extending lifespan. This is what huh. this uh, initiative is after. I think everyone up here is doing that in their own way. Yes, <laughs> yes we have a question up here. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Dan, I just wanted to ask your thoughts about the Solyndra bankruptcy and how you think that's going to impact the green uh, job movement. Sure. Um, I assume by now many of you have heard and some of you haven't heard about uh, the Solyndra uh, bankruptcy. One of the bigger solar companies went out of business. We actually had, had a, a couple go out of business recently. Uh, you know, people who don't like green jobs, who don't like clean energy, and who don't like this president are going to beat the drum about it. And I think we should be very clear about what, what it is and what it's not. Just investigations will figure it out. Look, this is risky stuff. Like, we're trying to figure out how to repower human civilization. Uh, it turns out some companies, some business models won't work out. That's the natural part of, of what we're up to. Just to get clear, though, about the, the, the dollars that we're talking about. You say, you know, $500 million sounds like a lot. Uh, this was a small part of the overall effort on the part of the administration. You're talking about 1.3% um, at risk for us of a $2.4 billion uh, loan guarantee program. Why do you care about that? Why did Solyndra go out of business? Could it be? Not that we put too much money into clean energy with our $2.4 billion loan guarantee program, which is to leverage private capital. It could be that we didn't put too, that we, the problem is that we put in too much. Maybe we put in too little. China, they didn't put in $2.4 billion. They put $33 billion on the table up against all of our solar companies this past year. So while we're doing food fight politics in Washington, D.C., and arguing about whether global warming is real, China put a $33 billion play against us, and they're now swamping the global markets with cheap solar to wipe out all of our companies so they can then own the market and then jack the prices up. That's all that's going on. Now, Solyndra is the first to go down, and sure enough, Washington reacts the same way. Who are you going to blame? Rather than saying, hold on a second, this is a canary in the coal mine for our entire solar industry. This is mercantilist attack on the United States by our good friends overseas, and we should respond as one country to figure out how we're going to protect our industry. That would be the right way to respond. And instead, what you're going to see is more nonsense. I think the voices of people like this, who uh, care about the country, who care about other countries, who care about workers in other countries, who care about the earth, should actually take this as an opportunity to l raise a discourse. And um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate. I feel, I feel awful for the workers at Solyndra. Uh, I certainly wish that the model had worked out, but if we're going to say that any uh, 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 venture that the U.S. government supports, if it fails, that therefore we can't invest in innovation anymore, then let's just go ahead and fold up our tents and, and let the rest of the world pass us by. That's the, that's the, that I, 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 I honestly feel uh, very passionately about this. I had nothing to do with the Solyndra thing, so it's not personal. Uh, I, I was not in my, they were not in my portfolio when I was in the White House, but I do know that I'm proud that the country is willing to, 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 to put public dollars on the table, to bring, bring in private capital, to try to get some breakthroughs here. And the fact that we're doing that against a $33 billion bet from China against us uh, makes me even more proud of the effort. I, I'd just like to add on to that because I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I just wanted to cite the McKinsey study, Unlocking Energy Efficiency in the U.S. Economy. Forget $33 billion. They suggest we could eliminate $1.2 trillion of waste in our economy and achieve an annual reduction 
of 1.1 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions annually, which is equivalent to taking all the cars and all the light trucks off the road, if we made $520 billion in upfront uh, investment. I mean, let's think bold. <laughs> you know, we are talking about a revolution. We're talking about saving our own lives. And uh, I, I, you know, we're going to have to get past what you call this logjam to a future with so many possibilities if we're brave enough to make the right investment. Hi, I think yes. you guys have been wonderful. I've learned a lot from this panel. Um, my question is, I think I'm very disturbed feeling, hearing people like Michelle Bachman, for example, say that she's going to bring back $2 gas. I mean, that's not possible. And also, she should be educating people about, you know, conservation, you know, just not, not just it's a fantasy. And just you mentioned oceans. And um, one thing that, you know, I think about a lot is just the poor recycling infrastructure in this country and all the plastic bottles and cans that people want to recycle and they can't. So where should that leadership come from? I mean, will it come from the states? Will it come from the federal government? Um, you know, the U.S. should be a leader in this and not so behind. it would be great if it came from the states and it came from the federal government, but I think the reality is it's coming from business. Um, and that may not be the, you know, the long-term best case, perfect scenario, but I think there's a lot that business is contributing and can further. Um, I mean, Walmart's, you know, Walmart's Walmart, but their focus with their supply chain of telling their supply chain to get to zero waste has a huge impact on a lot of companies and a lot of waste that was going to landfills that now is not. So, you know, is Walmart doing that so that they can double in size? Sure. But they're proving that it can be done. And so I think, and they're providing impetus in the market for new business models like ours. So, I mean, I think it, there's a lot coming from business because that's the only place that it can come from right now because of all the messed up discourse and lack of funding. <laughs> Were you going to say something then? <laughs> you don't have to talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. You, maybe you could speak to what you know, seems like the most obvious you know, disruptive opportunity for us to change the way the world operates when we have, you know, we can like talk about the you know, planet and the water, the sun, you know, um, all of the elements, the wind, I mean, that we could tap into all of these resources that are available to us and we have the technology and it's kind of this gift. And it's so obvious that we can completely turn the world around and, you know, when the economic crisis is upon us and we have every reason to create this green revolution and recapture our place in the world and why are we not doing it? Why know? are we still <laughs> having food fights in Washington? Well, well, first of all, what she just said was, was, was beautiful. We should probably just start, stop with that um, before, you know, I don't, I don't want to drag people over into the crazy stuff in D.C. Look, Washington, D.C. is never going to be any more beautiful than the American people. It's not going to be more courageous than the American people. It's not going to be any more innovative or insistent in change than the American people. One thing that we have to take responsibility for, uh, we got excited about hope and we got excited about change. You know, not everybody here, but some people did. And, um, and, and the last time I saw people really fired up passionate in large numbers was the inauguration, which is two and a half years ago. And we went from having a movement to treating the change in America like it was a movie. And people sat back and munched popcorn and started, you know, acting like the slogan of the movement was, yes, he can. I don't remember that being on the, 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 anybody's lips, yes, he can. It's supposed to be, yes, we can. And uh, it's our country, it's our planet, it's our future, and, and we still can. So. So, um, if and if any of you don't know about the Garrison Institute, it's a place that uses contemplative practice to address the problems of the world. And so, Mary was going to do a very brief um, period of contemplation, so that everyone can think about. Uh, reflect on what they took away from this and what they want to do about it. Yes, thank you. If, if everyone could just sit comfortably, put your feet in front of you, your hands on your knees or your lap, wherever they're comfortable. Um, look, uh, you can close your eyes or you can look on the ground, the space ahead of you. 
this room is filled with individuals with magnificent brains. Each one of you came here with your history, your perspective, your unique way of considering the world. You've heard so many different ideas, and now it's time, instead of bustling off and being asked, well, what did you hear? Well, gosh, there were so many lectures, I don't know. Take some time to think about what touched you personally. What 